Remember when Diddy got angry at 50 Cent for saying he slept with a rapper? Get your hand out my pocket, man. Get, get your hand out my pocket. I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing on the channel. Get your hand out my pocket, man. Look at me when I'm talking to you. I see, yo, yo. I see what you're doing. I see, I see what you're doing, man. I see what you're doing. Nah, nah, look at me, man. I see what you're doing, man. Yeah, you're going you gonna to make me. Okay, I'm telling you right now. On I Want to Work With Diddy, I'm going to physically put my hands on somebody for the ratings. And yeah, that's not it. Remember that time Diddy was slapping Jay-Z like this? It could be camaraderie, maybe some good brotherly love. I don't know. But remember that time when... Justin Bieber was doing this to Odell Beckham at Diddy's party. What in the world was Justin Bieber just doing? And this is not even it. Remember that time that Diddy was inebriated, I mean drunk out of his mind at Drink Champ saying this. Yeah, I love this drink. You you I like yeah. when you like this, Daddy. Yeah, yeah, you put my bag daddy, yeah, I like when you when oh, you scrambling right and scraping no, for no, 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 shit. No, 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 I, got I like that. Shit, Did you miss me though? Mm. For real, because we. I'm I saying miss, it seems like a thing. I miss his birthday party, party. man. Man, but I'm talking about for your birthday. Huh? Why won't you party with me for your birthday, man? I, I, we we party for my birthday before. You came to my party. You know? No, but me, you ain't never really party. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, I, and when he was asked about it, he played ignorant and foolish. We segueing into the Drink Champs interview <laughs> when you was with Nori and Fab and Jada and mm -hmm. everybody. They made a compilation video with you because they said you were sounding real suspect mm. on the on the interview. Yeah. Did you see that? Of course, nah. I didn't see it. No, nah, I didn't see it. You didn't see it. I saw the guy. Oh, Come yeah. on, man. You saw hey, that on the world. Hey, yo, star. And hey, on yo, the tram. Check, check this out. When they started playing the game, the pause game. I would definitely... That came from Harlem too, by yeah, the way. Yeah, came from Harlem. I definitely would say some, oh my, whoa, the crowd would be like, whoa, did he just say that? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I don't play games, y'all know. You know what I'm saying? I'm a grown man. I don't play games. But, um, yeah. Did the you compilation, nah, I was, I was coming off of being in Miami at night of party and I don't really remember what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of Diddy to accept that his happiness is too big to fit inside a closet, I think he needs to bring it out and let it shine. I mean, he would rather put his ball of fist, but he would rather fist fight Usher over some type of milk. Back in the days when he was like 10 and I was a little bit older, his older brother, we used to fight over the over the Frosted Flakes, you know what I'm saying, before paws was invented. <laughs> but it's my brother for real. We used to actually wrestle off of the off of the frosted place because he used to always get up early. With me. <laughs> now he's one of the richest stars yo, in the world. And I'm yo, like, what, what the did Puff just say? And the details of Diddy's lawsuit has been crazy. I mean, details pointing to him blowing up cars, several of his freak off parties with very young, innocent minded women present, alcohol drinks that were tampered with, and many more ungodly, unsafe things. I mean, if it weren't for these lawsuits, we wouldn't even know that Diddy had a personal hitman. I mean, people who made people and problems disappear. But the thing that baffles me is how come Diddy didn't see this coming? He's smart to make a billion dollars, but not smart to see that what he was doing would lead to his downfall. Could his psychopathic tendencies be from what happened to his dad when he was young? Or was it the money that twisted Diddy all along the way? And what was he doing with <laughs> Justin Bieber and Usher just at the age of 10? And what other powerful people might this implicate if Diddy ever goes down? Diddy's party eyewitnesses. On February 9th, 2022, Vice, the media company, posted a snippet of a manager who revealed what it was like working at a hotel. First, he spoke about the hotel experience. The hotel industry is a wild experience that helps you understand how disconnected the wildly wealthy are. Second, he said he saw the darker side of humanity as rich men were often involved in some of the sickest things. I've seen the darker side of humanity, suicides, murders, spousal abuse, human trafficking. Soon after quitting his job, he's traumatized and he recalls how sick that made him feel. That shit stays with you for a long time. 
and obviously with all of that money to their name and nothing else to do the very rich men were doing the most depraved the most diabolical things everywhere i mean even though they had beds that were soft like tempur-pedic they did it on balconies sinks tables and even plate racks and if there was anything that had a surface they were on it too but when i saw this it was something that sounded a little too familiar uh, we're here uh with the lovely and talented jamie fox jamie uh what's what's a day in the life of jamie fox what's it like in the foxhole what's it <laughs> This is American actor and comedian Jamie Foxx on the late night show on May 16th of 2018. Because he had went to a party that was similar to the one we had just described, he had a lot to say. I would hang out and watch him throw parties. Sure, he right? famously threw his, like, his, his white party Bro, out. He would throw party. One point, I went to Philly, followed him all the way to Philly. He threw a party and he said, yo, Playboy, this party costs a million and a half dollars. Jamie Foxx was at this party and he described that the people he saw while he was at this party were some of the most famous people that we all knew. Here's what's crazy, the people at the party, Puff at that time had a room, Missy Elliott had a room, dun, 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 you know what I'm saying, dun, 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 dun. and standing on the wall nobody knew who he was, guess who it was? It was Jay-Z. However, what Jamie Foxx was saying also sounded a little too familiar. Another person, Keefe D would go on to describe a disturbing party that he once went to. He said Diddy and Tupac were just like couples. Puff and Tupac was like a couple, seemed like to me. And as Keefe D struggled to explain everything that went on in that party, he ended it by saying there were a lot of weird, unexplainable, and ungodly things going on. It's just a lot of, a lot of weird shit, dude. You know what I'm saying? It should. What was going on behind the scenes, right? What could possibly be happening at this party? What was happening at these Diddy party? And who are these people that were involved? As a result of this, on the day of Monday, March 25th, 2024, Diddy's house would be raided. The Department of Homeland Security conducting a raid at a house in Holmby Field Hills, believed to be connected to Sean Combs, the rapper and music executive, perhaps being linked to a sex trafficking investigation. Evidently, Diddy was a billionaire, rap mogul, and known all across the world. So as you might expect, helicopter cameras were on scene Monday afternoon, as dozens of federal agents simultaneously raided Diddy's mansion. They made their way towards the mansion's main entrance, broke through the house, marched in, and turned it upside down. After a few hours, a video later resurfaced showing Diddy's bedroom. I mean, it was torn apart. Wires and cords appeared to be checked. Cabinets and safes were left open. Drawers were cracked open. Boxes filled with gun ammo were broken. And even previously won Grammy Awards were left out like mere trash. Outside was paparazzis with cameras, Fox News reporting live, and many FBI agents coasted outside. I mean, Diddy was in some hot shit. And while this appeared to be one hell of a scene, it was. It seemed that they were looking for something. But what was this thing that they were looking for? Before we talk about that, we have to first see what happened after this raid, which was what happened to Diddy's private jet. Diddy's private jet. Black excellence, all black everything, all black crew, the greatest pilots in the world. Yes, sir. While feds raided Diddy's house, his private jet was flown to an island called Antigua in the Caribbean. Many questioned if Diddy was on board. Some said he was, others said he wasn't. Yet nobody knew. Photos obtained by ABC News capturing Combs' Love Air Jet in Antigua. No information about who, if anyone, was on the plane. But this photo was taken. It was of Diddy's private jet, and it was posted and shared all over social media because everybody was wondering where was Diddy. Many assumed that he was on board. But while you're wanted by the feds, Antigua would be the worst place to go. This is because Antigua has extradition laws with the US against criminals. Meaning, if you were to commit a crime and you fled to Antigua, maybe thought Antigua was gonna save your ass, Antigua will talk to the US because of the law that they have, extradition laws, they will ship your ass right back to the United States to serve your sentence. 
This was what happened to El Chapo's son. He was caught in Mexico, but was sent to the US, extradited, just so he can serve his life sentence. This is why I think it wouldn't be smart if Diddy was to flee to Antigua if he wanted to flee. Now, if he fled to a country like, say, China, Indonesia, maybe Iceland, or maybe far in Europe, like Belarus or something, you know, those countries with no extradition treaty, I think that would be a much safer option. And it will cause me to believe that Diddy did flee. But I think he's still in the United States. I actually don't think he went anywhere. I think the private jet was actually a distraction tactic to bring attention from him to something else. But it didn't work because look at all of this, look at all of this, we're all here <laughs> talking about Diddy, right? But with that FBI raid, I can't help but continue to think about what they were looking for, the missing tapes. At this point, I'm sure the stakes were high for Diddy. His house had been raided and he's probably laying low. He's probably pulling his connections together, trying to get out of this mess. But inside Diddy's party, what was truly going on that deserved this much of a raid, let alone this much of noise on CNN, ABC, and every mainstream media that you can find? Why was Diddy so hot? Apparently, they were looking for some tapes. Previously, on November 20th, 2016, Kanye West went on a 15 minute rant. He was live on stage, in front of thousands of people. It was one heck of a crazy experience. Phones were held up in the sky and Kanye West was on a floating stage. Yet, with the scenery, the things that were about to come next would be totally unexpected. Kanye began naming names. He said that he was putting his life on the line for this. And at last, Kanye admitted that billionaires had killers. And this story of Kanye matters because when he said billionaires like Jay-Z had killers, nobody believed him. Yet, people were quick to call him crazy, quick to say he had a nervous breakdown. And as a result of that rant, Kanye was put in the hospital. Kanye West is waking up in a Los Angeles hospital where he's now under observation reportedly for exhaustion and stress. And while we can argue that Kanye went crazy or not, if you look at today, especially the lawsuits and allegations surrounding Diddy, the things that Kanye said aren't too far off, right? Especially with the topic of billionaires and killers. In the parties of Diddy, a thick 75-page lawsuit indictment paper is filed against him, not only Sean Combs, who is Diddy, Justin Dior Combs, who is his son, Ethiopia had Tamarium, former CEO of Motown Records, Lucien Charles Grange, who might not be the CEO of Universal Music Group anymore after this, Christina Karam, the day-to-day -day manager of Diddy, Charlie's Recording Studios in Los Angeles, California, Love Records, Diddy's own child label with a very odd looking logo, Motown Records, Universal Music Group, the entire Combs Global Enterprise, which is a portfolio of Diddy's businesses, Anonymous John and Jane Doe's, and lastly, ABC Corporations. These allegations were from a man named Rodney, who was born and raised in Chicago with a musical background, who met Diddy because he was really a skilled producer, producing several songs on Diddy's rhythm and blues album titled The Love Album. Soon after accepting to work for Diddy, Rodney's life changed for the worst. Because the album was such a large project, Rodney lived with Diddy for a year and a month from September 2022 to November 2023, spending holidays, birthdays there, and even missing major family events. Rodney spent several weeks on Diddy's yacht, rented by Diddy. He witnessed, experienced, and lived and quote, saw many things that went far beyond his role as a producer. Through this entire year of living with Diddy, Rodney was able to go on Diddy's yachts and these yachts had phones with 4K cameras presence, meaning there were a lot of recordings and photos taken of things that were happening on this yacht. I mean, we're talking audio recordings of Diddy, his staff, and every one of his athlete friends, his billionaire friends, very powerful people engaging in serious career-ending illegal activities. I was curious, so I read the entire 75 pages. And it was indeed crazy. Like, the word crazy is an understatement. 
for how bad this is. And this is because it takes you into the world of really powerful and corrupt people. There were tactics of control and dominion used against other people. Things like promising someone a Grammy nomination of producer of the year to do really sick things. And then offering them a quarter million to do things that are, let's just say, not safe for YouTube, right? These photos, who are off the streets? Whom did he require Jones to have his way with at his home in Miami, Florida? With the tattoos, I'm sure someone on the internet has found them. There were album listening parties held in Diddy's home and multiple young adults that weren't even the age of 18. It's reported that there were at least five women in the crowd at these listening parties that were under the age of 16 and Diddy is here seen with one of them. At these parties, bottles of De Leon, Diddy's own liquor brand, were tampered with and contaminated with something called Tusi. It's a party powder, right? And as a result, they felt lightheaded and passed out due to the potency. There were picture proofs of these listening events, like this one. Diddy's ex-bodyguard, Gene, a long time ago, had detailed how Diddy used to spike drinks such as orange and cranberry juices with these party powders. Especially if they like mixed drinks, you understand? They see the bottles when they open them, and they trying to keep their eyes on because they don't want to get no kind of drugs put in their system. But what they don't understand is in the orange juice and it's in the cranberry juice. The Rodney Jones indictment continues that Diddy groomed Rodney to pass him off to his friends like Cuba Gooding Jr., who is an American actor known in movies such as Men of Honor and Boat Trip. Diddy left Rodney and Cuba alone in a room together on purpose, and this photo shows Gooding with his arm around Mr. Rodney Jones. And because everyone bends at Diddy's will, Mr. Jones recalls Diddy taking no for an answer. When it was reported in 1999 that Shine had shot up a nightclub in New York, Shine was sentenced to 10 years in prison for it. From 1999, he was released in 2010. But turns out he wasn't even the one that shot the gun that night, and Diddy was the one who shot it. Diddy bragged to Rodney multiple times saying he was indeed the one responsible for shooting that nightclub that night. They were at this party on screen when that happened. The indictment shows how corrupt even the police department, people that are supposed to uphold the law and protect the citizens, how corrupt they could be in terms of doing favors for very rich people. Because Diddy made it clear that he not only had power within the music industry, but also with the entire law enforcement. This person is Fahim Muhammad, who's known as Diddy's head of security, or Diddy's personal hitman. Combs usually describes Fahim as the person who has the power to make people and problems disappear. He instructed his staff that if they were ever pulled over by police, to call Mr. Fahim Muhammad, and immediately, police would leave them alone. In a situation, while Diddy was making his love album on September 12, 2022, at Chalice Recording Studio, him and his son Justin had gotten into a heated argument with a 30-year-old man named Mr. G. Soon, they'd move the argument from the studio into the bathroom, but thereafter, gunshots would ring out and someone would be shot. After the shooting, a crowd gathered around the restroom and there was Mr. G lying on the restroom floor, shot in the fetal position. Despite being the one who shot, Diddy came up with a plan, instructing everyone to lie to the police saying he had nothing to do with the shooting and Mr. G was shot outside by a drive-by assailant. Pictures that I won't be showing show the aftermath of the shooting where it was blood on the floor. I'm guessing Mr. G survived but it even says diddy did hire a cleaning crew to come and clean the studio's bathroom after this happened later because of what happened with mr g and diddy in the studio mr fahim muhammad with his connections to the lapd was contacted he lied to lapd strengthening the cover-up saying that g was indeed shot outside of the studio without any investigation law enforcement believed it it was even reported that Sir Lucian Grange, the CEO of Universal Music Group, who literally controls many of the music labels and music artists that we listen to, was also involved in Diddy's freak-off activities. It's said that with his huge line of credit, 
meaning a lot of money to his name, credit card that doesn't run out. He paid for and attended several of Diddy's listening parties in his LA mansion. Rodney recalls that when he comes to Diddy's home, they disappear for hours into Diddy's bedroom. And as said above, underage girls and spike drinks were always present at these homes. The report compares his day-to-day -day manager, which they call KK, known as Christina Karam, as the Jelaine Maxwell of Jeffrey Epstein. Jones also witnessed Diddy distribute firearms from his bedroom closet to individuals dressed in all black. Because of YouTube's guidelines, you know how they are with things like this and I won't be showing 2C or diving too deep into it but just know it's a pink substance that was put into these drinks that they were drinking. 2C is the pink powder that Diddy takes that even all his housekeepers are instructed to keep in pouches just for whenever he needs it. Under that a list of names were listed and the things each staff did were mind-blowing. For example, Stevie J recruited streetwalkers and participated in Diddy's freak off parties. Justin Combs, Diddy's very own son, engaged in the freak offs too, knowing about the young woman and spiked drinks. Brendan Paul, who worked as Diddy's weapon mule, transported guns and substances from Mexico and distributed all of them to Diddy. Frankie Santella, who carried the cash around, paid Brandon for these illegal stuff. Moy Buan, who goes around and hires street workers, attended and participated in these freak offs. And it gets even worse here because Mr. Jones discovered that Diddy had hidden cameras in every corner of his house. And those hidden cameras had several celebrities, music label executives, politicians, and even known athletes participating in some crazy stuff, which I believe is what the FBI were looking for. Worse, every one of those individuals were probably recorded without their knowledge. So what Diddy now has is some compromising, career-ending, world-shaking footages if they ever touch the light of day. Do you think they'll touch the light of day? Like with those videos, would they? do you think they would come out sometime? I don't think so. But because of this, I'm sure many people are shaking in their boots right now, hoping that their tapes aren't released. Because as a result of this lawsuit alone, Meek Mill, whose rap image is based around being tough, he's named in Diddy's lawsuit as a redacted rapper who did things that 50 Cent was saying with Diddy. And remember when 50 Cent said Diddy took him shopping? Now, now Fifth, when you continuously call Puff gay, does that affect no. your relationships in Hollywood? I don't call no, I don't call I don't call him gay. I said Let I, me read this. Let me read okay, it, read. Fifth. Oh my god. Sorry I can no longer Shades help confused. you guys. Soon you will all be gay and happy. You are all now left under the leadership of Puffy Daddy. Report to the nearest rainbow. Then the thieves in theaters January. Oh, that's why he says things. He doesn't even know what he's saying is like fruity. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like he says something fabulous and he goes, yo, no, we no, but me and you, we ain't party. Like we need to party. What is he talking about? When people say that to me, I get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> like, I get uncomfortable. Like he said he said something to me one time a long time ago oh, at Chris Lighty's wedding. He told me he'd take me shopping. I looked at him like, what the, what the, what'd you just say? <laughs> Let yeah. me move, man, before I do something. You're going to make me mess up the wedding. And yeah, that wasn't too far from the truth because I know Meek Mill's fans are livid right now because it's been said that Meek Mill and Diddy were engaged in some brotherly love and even sometimes appearing outside in matching clothes like couples. And even though Meek Mill grew up spitting bars, I'm curious to what else he was spitting because, I mean, since Meek Mill's career fell from these documents alone, imagine who might suffer from the same consequences depending on who shows up in those tapes. I mean, like, this could implicate British royals like Prince Harry because here he's seen with Diddy, respected former presidents like Barack Obama because here he's seen with Diddy, large company CEOs like Lucien Grange because he's in the lawsuit at leads like LeBron James because there's a video of LeBron floating around right now that's him dancing with Diddy or in the same room with Diddy.
I got the ability to sit on my lap. Sometimes I'm harder than pulling a man. That's a low earth. That is a low earth. That rocket chain. That just would trip out of space. I was in birth. I'm on my tongue. They ain't got to do it. They ain't got to do it. I'm on my work. 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 I'm on my work.
and I lived with Sean Puffy Combs for a year. That's the crazy thing. Now, that yeah. was L.A. Reid's idea, right? We're sending New you over York to City. something called Puffy Flavor Camp. There you go. <laughs> to learn <laughs> some... Flavor Camp. Yeah, Flavor that's camp. what it was called. And you're going to go to Puff Daddy's. He's In pre- the 90s. Do you understand what that's like? Puffy's place was like just filled with chicks and orging like nonstop, right? No, not really. I Come mean, on. but did I, hey, it was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was... And it was <laughs> about I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. It was it was pretty wild. It was, so nobody it was tried to, you know, some woman didn't come along. I didn't say that. Okay. I, I didn't but say you that. <laughs> what I did say is that there were very curious things taking place. Uh huh. And I didn't necessarily understand it. Uh huh. Biggie Smalls was there. Biggie Smalls was there. Lil Kim, Craig Mack. All you know, these people all are hanging these, around. All, yeah, man. Faith Evans. Jodeci, Mary okay? J. Blige, they ain't know nothing about this shit. Oh. <laughs> I was having a good time, you know what I mean? But you have to kind of ask, where did this all begin, right? How did Diddy get so sick? I mean, is it the power that corrupted him along the way? Is it the loss of his dad? Is it lust? Why does it seem like his whole empire is crumbling right in front of his own eyes? The rise of Diddy. By many accounts, the 1970s marked one of the darkest periods in Harlem's history, with them just going through a race riot in the late 60s. The neighborhood was littered with widespread crime, poor housing, and a lack of proper education. I mean, on your screen, you're seeing how dilapidated New York looked back then. But right here was where people like Frank Lucas, who are people who deal substances, he was trading a lot and he was very known in Harlem. Among those affected by this turmoil of Harlem was a young family with the breadwinner who was Melvin Earl Combs. He has Diddy's last name. This was Diddy's dad. And Diddy's family didn't really have much at this time. So his dad became a street hustler. He fed junkies with their necessities. He turned to the streets, became a close associate of Frank Lucas, the DL. However, Melvin's life would change very drastic on November 4th, 1969, when he and his wife, Janice Combs, welcomed their first ever child, Sean John Combs. Now, being a father, Melvin had to choose parenting, gain legal money like maybe a job, or continue dealing in the streets. If he chose the job, he would be earning a stable income without the fear of death. But if he chose the streets, he'd be serving, making quite good money, but with the potential of getting shot and losing his life. What did Melvin do? So he made his decision and it was the streets. And as a result of Melvin's decisions in 1972, in the middle of a transaction, Melvin was gunned down in Central Park West in a deal gone wrong. Because of this, Diddy became fatherless left alone with his mother just at the tender age of two. And as you might expect, growing up without a father in New York was no easy feat for anybody, let alone Diddy and his mom. It put them in the most terrible conditions of a cramped, dingy apartment with peeling paint and flickering lights. Diddy remembers that one day he was growing up and he woke up and there were 15 roaches all on his face. I had like 15 roaches on my face. Don't ask me how I know it was 15, but I promise you it was more than 15, but I don't want to really like bug you out. All over my face. And I said, never again. At the time, hip hop was hot. Dancers spun and boomboxes blared. To cope with the loss, Diddy immersed himself in this vibrant hip hop culture that was here at the time. And it was going to grow. And Diddy saw this, so he began studying the greats. Artists of the time like LL Cool J, KRS One, Rakim, and Slick Rick. And Diddy began envisioning himself amongst them. At home, it wasn't such a good story though. He watched as his mother, who was now a widow, had worked tirelessly to provide for him and his sister. In school, he found himself in street fights and he would huff and puff when he got angry, which was the reason why people started calling him Puff. And very forward in the second year at Howard University, at the disapproval of his own mom, he dropped out, turned a back on school forever. And with this decision, he's now left to make his own decision, either make music or starve. Which do you think he's gonna do? Chasing the dream. Diddy had worked his way up at this point, and he's now an intern at Uptown Records. Sean, known as Diddy, Sean Puffy Combs, 
Diddy at the time began his path to greatness, but at this time he didn't even know he was going to be as big as he is today. Under the guidance of Andre Harrell, he helped mold the sound of a generation. He was an A&R, discovering talents like Jodeci and Mary J. Blige. But, oh yeah, tell me a little bit about Big Bear and why do you like working with him? Because, you know, he's not intimidated by youth, you know what I'm saying? He knows what's going on to leave my legacy behind. It's me and more adults out there that kind of teach the young, trust as myself. And, you know, basically leave a legacy behind, at least something behind, you know, so go out and Andre. I don't remember, but if you didn't know the Andre Durrell over here in the middle, and uh, people can talk about that, I've been reading about it in the New York Times, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out here that hadn't heard of him before, but they saw that article in the Times and said, okay, wow, him may have doing something. But, you know, this guy was definitely what's my age. You want to know what everybody's doing, how old they are. <laughs> Andre, what's happening? Tell me about the new ventures that are going on in the yeah. But what we did, we just made a vertically integrated deal with me that we do film, television, and record. And what we are able to do now is take our record size and cross them in the television and film like a heavy D. He had a reputation for throwing legendary parties at the time, attracting athletes, musicians, and New York's finest. He was living the dream and he seemed destined for stardom. But what he didn't realize was that success bred envy and after becoming an A&R executive just at Uptown, Diddy's world came crashing down when he was fired by Andre Harrell in 1993. Now, nobody knows why Andre fired Diddy, it's just been said that it was envy, so we're gonna call it that. Betrayed by the man that he once called his mentor, he learned his first lesson in the music industry. Loyalty was scarce and trust was easily broken. Now, Diddy Jobless could either choose to work another job or change his entire life by chasing his own music and creating his own path. And that's what he did. He created his own path and he became a shrewd businessman ready to do whatever it takes to achieve his goals. Though the music industry chewed him, spat him out, he gave them artists, they gave him a 30 day notice, he was determined to rise stronger than ever before. So he quickly began making moves. He surrounded himself with a team of hustlers who shared his own vision and hungers for success. Together, they laid the foundation for what would become Bad Boy Records. Puffy, Bad Boy, Freddie Tash. Yeah. Yo, what up, Bob? What's up, baby? What's up, baby? What's up, baby? Everything is all good in the hood. Yeah, yeah. The headquarters right here, kid. Bad Boy Entertainment. I named it a bad boy because I wanted to go against the grain. Anytime you go against the grain, they consider you like kind of bad. Nothing negative, nothing like hardcore. Just, I didn't want to be regular. I didn't want to just make records. I didn't want to just make money. I wanted to make history and making music that's timeless. Music that's gonna be around when I'm not here, when my kids ain't here. Things that, you know, really affect the way of life. Under the Bad Boy banner, legends were born. The Notorious B.I.G., Craig Mack, Faith Evans, each one a testament to Diddy's eyes for talent. Bad Boy first releases Flavor in Your Ear by Craig Mack and Ready to Die by Biggie Smalls. And at this time, this was the time of CDs, meaning they were literally selling physical copies. Streams weren't available, right? Spotify wasn't a thing. So, and these songs that I just said they made, they went platinum, meaning they cashed in millions of dollars. So because these songs, I looked up how much a CD was and it was 99 cents to $3 per CD. And these songs, they went platinum, like I said, meaning they sold a million times. And those platinum albums, those platinum singles and chart top of hits just solidified who Diddy was in the music industry. Yo MTV We're Raps, back. and we up in the house we that these bad boys bad built, boys. you know what I'm saying? No Puffy and crew. So Puffy. Yo, this my crew than me. This is family. Artists always first, baby. Puffy, take it away. Check it out. This is my man, the Notorious B.I.G. What's the deal? What's going on? My man, Craig Mack. Ah. It's my foundation, you know what I'm saying? It's my life right here. We, we, we all need each other to live and breathe, and that's the way we treat each other. And his, him and his team continued dominating the charts. When you talked about Bad Boy, you had to talk about Biggie. The same year 1995, Bad Boy got more platinum releases by Total and Faith Evans, even under Diddy's guidance. So all of these millions is coming in. Platinum albums, platinum albums, and Diddy is getting richer and richer and richer. Under Diddy's guidance, the label continued to expand, right? 
They added producers like Easy Moby, Chucky Thompson, and DDOT. But success was just going to come at a price. For three years leading up to 1995, Rap had been dominated by the West Coast, with labels such as Death Row Records leading the scenes, making their millions. And so, Bad Boy Records and Death Row Records, who are on the West Coast, were going to clash. And as the rap world started taking sides, tensions continued to escalate between Bad Boy and Death Row. Suge Knight, who was the CEO of Death Row, and Diddy, who was the CEO of Bad Boy, they wouldn't get along. Suge held Diddy responsible, and at this time, a lot of shady things we can say have already started to happen. People are dying already because millions are involved and these are street guys. So Suge, he held Diddy responsible for the shooting of his friend, Jake Robles. I'm guessing Jake Robles was probably somebody who's going to do something for Suge that would make him come on top of Diddy. And since they're competing, Diddy doesn't want this to happen. So Diddy probably takes out Jake Robles and... Jake was gonna help Suge advance his career. Diddy took out Jake. Because of this, tension escalated. Full blown war. This tracks left and right. I mean, it was a war between the two coasts. Which boy, I like to thank God. Think of all I like to thank my whole entire Death Row family on both sides. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like to tell two park keep his guards up. We ride with him. The one other thing, like we say, any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, don't worry about, we won't have to worry about the negative producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record. They ask me, come to Death Rock. The situation escalated when Suge's very own Tupac alleged that Bad Boy, specifically Biggie and Diddy, were responsible for his own shooting in November 1994 at Quad Studios and Times Squares. Tupac would go on to release Hit Em Up, dissing Diddy and Biggie. Tensions would soar very high, and when there's tension that's this high, somebody has to cool it down. Tragically, this feud and tension would take a deadly turn. Tupac would be shot in Las Vegas on September 7th, 1996, and he'd pass away just six days later on September 13th. The news would send shockwaves throughout the entire hip hop community. Near fatal shooting, but he couldn't survive a second. Rap star Tupac Shakur died last night after a brief life in a rough business. When he was shot in this car in Las Vegas, he was out on bail while appealing a four and a half year sentence for sexual assault. West Coast is shaken. The East Coast probably celebrating leaving many to wonder if Bad Boy were the ones responsible for Tupac's death. Now, it was this documentary that claimed, which we know wasn't true. Yeah, yeah, check this out. We don't, we don't talk about things that are nonsense. We don't even entertain nonsense, my brother. So we're not even going to even go there with all due respect, but I appreciate you as a journalist asking. Thank you. Because, you listen, seven years ago, I'd have been like, yo, did you hire somebody to kill Pac? But no, you do it like a journalist. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, we wouldn't even get into nonsense like that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not Which we never believed, by the way. Yeah, thank you. Just months later, on March 9th, 1997, Biggie himself would be gunned down in Los Angeles, California. The second time in six months, a star in the often brutal world of gangster rap has been gunned down. This time, it was notorious B.I.G. The rapper known as Biggie Smalls was shot several times as he sat in his Chevy Suburban early this morning outside the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles. Smalls had been attending a party honoring winners of the Soul Train Music Awards, at which he made an appearance Friday night. What's up, Cali? After the shooting, Smalls was taken to Cedar sinai Medical Center, where he was pronounced dead. The West Coast must have revenged, right? And this crime of what happened to Biggie remains unsolved to this day. Just like that, both Tupac and Biggie, one of the 2000's greatest artists, were dead. The deaths of both rap icons came as a shock to so many. It made many people to speculate about the nature of their deaths. In the wake of Biggie's tragic death, Diddy found himself at a crossroad. He had lost his best friend, his prodigy, and it shook him to the core. But it also fueled his determination to want to even achieve more, to want to gain more power, and succeed better than he has. At this point, you can say that Diddy's net worth was around $20 million. 
Diddy put his grief into music. His solo album, No Way Out, and the tribute song, I'll Be Missing You, became instant hits, topping charts, and solidifying Diddy as a solo artist. But he was more of a businessman than an artist, right? And all of a sudden, and I'm guessing all of this death around him, continued to pile up and Diddy began drinking and engaging in fights, landing him in some hot water with the feds. In 1999, he was arrested for beating another music executive with a chair, a phone, and a champagne bottle. He was then forced to pay a fine and take anger management classes. That same year, he won't listen. He was involved in shooting a club in Manhattan where he was attending a party with his then girlfriend Jennifer Lopez. Witnesses said they saw Diddy with a gun, but it was his friend, Shine, who caught the charges and faced 10 years in prison for. In the lawsuit today, Diddy admits to being the one who shot the gun that night. Thanks to his legal trouble, what was seen as Diddy spiraling out of control, many artists began to leave Bad Boy Records. They weren't getting paid, yet all of these millions were coming in, yet they weren't seeing nothing. I mean, this led to a decline in album sales. Artists were leaving. Artists are dead at this point. And this painted, this looked like it would be Diddy's end in the music business. And now with all of these records and the masters that Diddy owned from these artists and he's generating income from them whenever they listen and bought CDs, Diddy now owned a stake in the hip hop industry. And people, companies that wanted to use these artists' music, they would have to consult with Diddy to use the music. This is how Diddy really got rich. Diddy would begin talking with the Warner Music Group, Electra Records, and they would get into a deal that would ultimately fall through. So, Bad Boy started signing distribution deals with Universal, which is Disney. I mean, he's signing with Disney. Disney is rich, my guy. Under the terms of the deal, he said that he wanted to own 100% of his own company, while Universal would just handle the distribution, provide marketing, and promotional support. So, they gave him that. They gave him 100%, and Diddy, because he owned so many artist catalogs, he was just getting richer and richer by the day. And just like that, Diddy had gone from a washed up producer to one of the richest men in America. I mean, at this time, you can say his net worth was around 50 to 60 million. At this time, having a net worth over that, despite growing up fatherless, ex experiencing betrayal from Andre Harrell, and even losing one of his best friends in a gang war, Diddy persevered, emerging as one of the first in the music industry to mix hip hop, business, and luxury together. His fashion label, Sean John, became known for high-end menswear. He made some money from that. He promoted brands of vodka, tequila, hosted exclusive parties in the Hampton. And all of this just gave Diddy more and more accolades, and he was just known. Too known, too rich, too powerful, and by the day, he was getting more and more power. And although he was no longer in his 90s prime, Diddy remained a cultural icon. I mean, loved by many, he gained the respect of fans and the industry as a whole. However, as Diddy basked in his glow of his achievements, a sense of invisibility, I think, is what took hold of him. Especially a belief that he was God and untouchable. You know, when you start making so much money, you begin to think you're above everybody else, you begin to think you're above God himself, and it becomes your downfall. And little did he know that that pattern of thinking was about to be his downfall. And we have to ask, right? What would Diddy do once he does get caught? Or even if he is gonna get caught? And I doubt he's gonna get caught, but what would he do if he does? Sociopathic tendencies. People like Reggie Wright has made their predictions on what Diddy would do if he gets caught. But he need to build a spot over there in Bali for his boy Puffy. Puffy, need, I warn Keefe D to take his ass over there. There's no extradition laws over there. So I'm warning you now, Puffy. Take your ass over there. Reggie Prediction. I know Puffy is smart enough, and he probably done already cleaned his houses. But sex, sexual predators, what do they do? What do, and we'd be like, damn, why? They treat their sex tapes like yeah, remember that song, Me and My Girlfriend that Pac did? What he was talking about? What was Pac talking about, y'all? And that? Do y'all really know what he was talking about? For those of y'all know what he's talking about, he was talking about a gun, but 
sexual predators is what hold on to their tapes. And cops know that. So I wouldn't be surprised if some storages or some of Puffy properties be getting raided real soon because they need to get to those tapes. They get one of those tapes with him with those little people that's been making the accusations. Woo, man. <laughs> Done. <laughs> but Puffy the type here, he'll blow his brains out. Guarantee y'all. <laughs> or do like he did on that, that court screw uh, uh, lie. How he did. We know what you did, Puff. Misa told us. Nigga, you slit your wrist. He gonna do something stupid like that. I know Diddy is wild, but is he wild enough to do that? You know, part of me believes he will work his magic. I mean, he knows politicians, right? These are people that can get him out of tough situations like this because of ties, this close ties that they all have together. Do something for me, I do something for you. And that's the video I plan to make. You know, politicians, they sometimes use rap to get into positions of power. Like presidents using Diddy to connect to the hip hop audience and the black people and and get them on their side. It's, it's a whole lot. Of, it's, a, it's a whole lot of stuff. I do find this entire situation sad, considering you know how such little amount of us black folks get to that point of success, and just because of lust, the inability to control yourself, you're seeing it all burn down right in front of your eyes, right? And I saw a video on Twitter with a guy making a great point too. Dude created one of the greatest musical legacies, a family became a billionaire and ruined his legacy, throwing it all away because he couldn't control his callous sexual urges, the common downfall of the man. Uh, of course, we don't know for sure if Diddy's guilty or not, so because it hasn't gotten to court, but there's a, a bigger picture uh, and a lesson here for black boys and men. Uh, it is commonly a downfall for, for men, even before they become men. And I do think it's necessary to have this conversation because oftentimes black boys aren't taught anything as it relates to their sex life or when those hormones and urges start. If anything, we may be taught, use a condom if you do, or don't bring no kids home. So there's not really a framework for what to do with your sex drive. And because of that, and because of a culture that kind of encourages and says that manhood is wild, reckless sex, racking up your numbers, getting as many as possible, this can turn to a much larger issue where there isn't any type of restraint or management as it relates to sexual urges, and it can turn into the situation that we see being asserted with Diddy and in, in other situations, because the sole focus is getting what you want out of the situation sexually without regard for risk to yourself, others, people's emotions, people's mental state, finances. We know that many men will put themselves in compromising positions due to the potential of being able to have sex in a particular situation. We, th we th go against all better judgment just because there's potential for sex and that's something that needs to be managed rather than encouraged. But we're in a culture where for the average straight man it's encouraged go after it if you want it and while there is this idea of, of shooting your shot and having some courage and being able to accept rejection this does go too far for some people and they end up in situations like this so we want to encourage a culture of sexual discipline rather than a more hedonistic view that says life is about any pleasure uh, that I want, forsaking all others. And granted, Diddy did have an entire black male operation going, but if he had better framework and guidance as a young man, possibly maybe early in his life, I don't think his life would have spiraled out of control like this, right? I also do believe Diddy is somewhat of a psychopath, and if he wasn't a psychopath as he is, I don't think he would have made it this far. We seem to reward psychopaths with such god complexes that it becomes such a thing to either ponder, maybe laugh, or even cry at. I mean, articles will even tell you that being psychopathic is a positive character trait, okay? And the way everything is all set up is like, capitalism and all of that, sociopathic tendencies is what seems to win. 
right by default you know and even though life is tough and there are a ton of things to learn and this one thing has been one heck of a learning experience for me you know and another part of me thinks that if half of those 25 plus serious allegation sticks you can expect diddy to be going away for life